it might be a very short one because we are done with content related things. But however, I thought uh, with this last session, we should just go through and we do um, at a high level the revision just to refresh our mind in terms of what we have learned up to so far. And then I can answer any question that you have relating to your module. If there are still certain things that you want me to respond to. Because you all have different exams and your exam papers are different, are set by different lecturers. So we cannot do any, uh, we cannot look at an exam paper because then it means I'm going to look at one exam paper and ignore the other modules, maybe here because we have STA 1610, STA 1510, and um, and 1501. So for that purpose, I will see if we can have an exam preparation session for individual modules so that then we can look at your exam papers, your specific exam paper, and then look at how you tackle questions from that um, exam paper. <clears throat> but that does not take away the fact that for every exercise, every activity, most of them that we use, they are similar to what you will receive in your exam, whether you're doing 1610, 1510, or 1501, it will be the same. Uh, if you're writing a multiple choice questions, the questions are the same that we have been using so the past eight months or so or seven months or so. Okay, so we can start with today's session. Uh, please remember to complete the register. I've just posted it in the chat. Um, and remember, if you have any questions, relating to the content, if you need any assistance, please send me an email. My email address is eboy at gmisa.ac.za and copy CT and TAT. Uh, for those who have been participating in the tutorial session week in week out, you do have in the next couple of weeks, you do have the opportunity to request for a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. If you have not been completing your register, it might be very difficult for me to, to prioritize your one-on-one. -on -one. So you need to make sure that you always complete, you always have been completing your, your register because this is, something that I'm going to offer to those who have been part of the sessions um, to get an opportunity to sit with me one on one online and we go through your concerns. Um, you can book a session with me. I will send the link to how you book a session to the um, to your emails. Um, I will ask uh, Unisa to send you um, an email directly with the link to, on how you uh, join the session or how you book a session because there is a register and a, uh, a calendar that you can use. Okay. So today we were supposed to look at the techniques of how to effectively answer questions and we were supposed to unpack the exam question papers. And like I said already, because you come from multiple um, uh, uh, modules, it's going to be impossible to do it in the same session like this. So what I will do, uh, we'll go into uh, revision straight away, and then we will go into question and answer. But before we start with today's session, uh, 
Are there any questions that you want to ask? Anything that you want me to clarify? Uh, you can go ahead. Anything? Anyone? Are you good? Are you happy? It doesn't help for me to be the only person talking in this session as well, because I also want to know which um, area was when, the most difficult for you guys so that we can spend even okay. more time. Yes, just this. How are you, this Lizzie? I'm good, thanks. And how are you? I'm fine. Uh, I am driving. I will be in my destination uh, maybe in 10 minutes' time. Okay. But there was something which you touched when you were dealing with this uh, presentation or with regard to those uh, the, the graphs, some, or is it graphs, something like that, whereby the, on the other side is going to the left and on, it is going to the right. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't have Google by that time. I'm not sure whether it's the graphs. If you can touch on them, it will assist me. Um, are you talking about probabilities? Yes. Okay. We will look yes, at that. Touch. Yes, this is. I will reach my destination, I think, in 15 to 10 minutes. Okay. Yes. Others? Are there any questions, comments? Things that you want us to spend more time on? Good morning, uh, everyone. Morning, Slizzy. Morning. Um, on myself, I would like for us to spend some time on the probabilities. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to find out when I have a p-value of 5.66, I mean, a z-value, sorry, a z-value of 5.66, what could the value of the p-value be without okay. having to go and so try to find it? it also depends on whether, where are you, um, uh, are you talking about hypothesis testing, right? Yeah, we're not talking about... We're talking about the hypothesis testing, so therefore it means you need to tell me whether are you having a one-tail test or a two-tail test because it depends on the, on that as well, how you will find your p-value or determine your p-value as well as if it's a one-tail test, is it in the upper side or is it in the lower side? As well as what was the, the Z value negative or positive? All those things you need to consider them, especially for the P value. But we will get to that just now. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So I don't have a particular question, but I think throughout this entire module, the, the one or the few things that were but difficult were definitely the probabilities for me. I didn't grasp it as well as what I did with the other chapters that we were doing. So I would want to spend more time on that as well. OK, so when you say the probabilities, are you referring to the basic probabilities or are you referring to the normal probabilities or discrete probabilities? Because we start talking about probabilities from study unit um, for basic probabilities. Five, six, yeah. um, it was poison and it was okay. um, binomial. So yeah. Okay. Are you talking about the uh, discrete probabilities. Correct, yeah. Makes it easy to understand which one you're referring to as well. Uh, Yvette, 
Oh, sorry. Yes, you can go ahead. Apologies. I also wanted to find out with the normal distribution. I know we did this part, but I think I'm still struggling with that as well. When the, the Z value is like a, it's greater than a negative number. Uh -huh. Do we still go and say one minus the value from the small side, from the negative side? Uh, minus. Yes, ma'am. I just want to find out which module are you doing? Uh, 1501. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, your table for the probabilities it should be the same, for, especially for yes. the basic probability. Yes, for the, okay. it should be this. Oh, for the normal probability, it should be the same with the I negative think... and positive. I think what I'm struggling with that is that I know when it's a positive value, I would just go to the big side and say mm. one minus the value from the big side. So now I get stuck when it's a negative value that do I still go to the small table? No, and minus no, no, no. Remember also when we get to the prop to the normal distribution, I will we'll discuss this further. Okay. Remember, it depends on what sign was that was did it say you need to find the probability of a greater than or did yes. it say you need to find the probability of a less than of regardless a if it, regardless of whether it's negative or positive if you got the probability of a less than the value you see on the negative side table or the value you see on the positive side it is that value if you're going to find the probability of a greater than, regardless of whether you find your Z value is negative or positive, the value you find on the table, you have to subtract it from one. Those oh, are the sir. things that you always need to remember. It doesn't mean that if it's greater than and it's positive, you only need to subtract from one. If it's negative, you don't. You still have to do the same. But we will get to that and we will discuss. Thank you so future. much. I was so stuck. OK, so event, you're the only person who hasn't said anything. Is there anything that you're struggling with or are you happy? I think I'm still struggling with the formula for chi-squared. For chi-squared? When you apply the formula without using Excel, Excel, I am fine with Excel, but that's good. That's okay. formula. Okay. Yeah, so with that one, you need to be able to know how to use your calculator properly, right? Because it's just about substituting the values after you have calculated your expected value and then just calculating. And remember, it's your observed minus your expected squared. You, you square the top part and divide by the expected and then add the next one. And it's just like that. It repeats itself. So it should be easy and straightforward. But we will look at that as well so that we can calculate it manually. Because I remember that I well, we didn't spend more time on the manual calculation or what on using a formula for the calculation, we spent more time on using the template because my assumptions were by now you should know how to use a formula and do some calculations. But we, are, we can look at that as well. So let's get to it. I have prepared a couple of slides and then I realized, but it's no use for me to go through the slides. We can have a discussion. So but we will just go through some of those uh, slides and then we can go and dig deep into the concept that you all raised, because I think that's where uh, the majority of you have the challenges with. OK, so. Remember for statistics, uh, the questions in your exam, uh, there will be, you will, you are required to know the content, right? Which means you need to know how to describe things, how to 
uh, how things are built, um, uh, what are the definition of certain things and what do they mean, how to interpret them. You still need to know those things. On top of it, you also need to know how to do calculations. Um, and it means, therefore, you need to always know which formula to use uh, and when to use it and how to calculate it. Um, those are the things. You also are expected to know how to use uh, your tables, uh, since there are statistical tables that we have introduced since from study unit uh, six or study unit five, when we started with discrete probabilities up until you, your last study unit, which includes chi-squared, where, um, uh, uh, where you need to be able to use your tables. So you just need to know how to use them, how to find certain things from those tables as well, and how to read them properly. Uh, you are expected to have a calculator uh, to calculate because it, calculations you cannot do mentally. You need to be able to calculate them. So starting from the beginning, remember we start from the introduction of statistics. Most of you would have forgotten about all that because we did that right at the beginning of the year. So you still need to remember that uh, what is statistics, uh, what are the branches of statistics that we have, uh, which is the descriptive statistics and the inferential statistics. We st you still need to know how to describe them. That descriptive statistics is about describing and summarizing and visualization of the data, whereas the inferential statistics is about inferring or making um, uh, decisions about the population, right? You also need to be able to know what is a population, what is a sample, and what are the measures that comes from a population, which are called the, the, the parameters, and what are the measures that comes from a sample, which are called the statistics, so that you should be able to know how to classify those. That is, sum. a sample is a subset of your population. On top of this, you need to be able to know and remember that from the population or the sample, there are things that uh, we collect, like your variables, which there are two types of variables, numerical variables or categorical variables. Numerical variables also are called quantitative variables. And you also have categorical variables, which are also called qualitative variables. On top of all these variables, you need to be able to know that in qualitative variable, there are two data uh, or variable or data that we have. We in qualitative um, variable and what type of variables are those? Those are variables that you can put into um, into categories and for quantitative variables there are two which is discrete and continuous and these are variables that you can either measure or count so if something you can measure it means it is continuous if you count it it is discrete there are also levels within the variables or the data that we have in cut categorical variables, there are two levels, nominal, ordinal. You need to remember that nominal, it's data that does not have any order. Ordinal, there is an order or rank. Uh, you also need to know that in quantitative variables, there are also two levels of measurement or scales of measurement, which is uh, interval and ratio. One does not have a true zero and one has a true zero. For example, an interval like temperature is an interval value because zero from a temperature is another temperature, which is it, it's cold, but it can also go into the negative side. 
a ratio. For example, ratio we deal with distance zero it has a true meaning. Meaning is if I moved zero distance, it means I haven't moved at all. Right. Uh, you also need to know from chapter two or the next level. How to visualize the data that we just spoke about. You need to know that for categorical data, what are the types of variable, um, the types of visualization you can do? Uh, we can use tables, pie chart, and bar chart. But you also need to know the properties of each one of them. How are they built? When we talk about numerical data, you need to be able to know how to visualize the numerical data by means of ordered array. It means sometimes you will need to order your data from lowest to highest and you need to visualize the data by means of frequency distribution histogram uh, a histogram a polygon if, um, and an ogif um, and when you have an ordered array you can use what we call a stem and leaf and remember there is one stem many leaves and the stem and leaf plot can take many form a hundred stem and leaf, ten stem and leaf, hundred and uh, sorry, a thousand stem and leaf or a decimal stem and leaf. You need to be able to know how to build each one of them and how to deconstruct one of them so that you go back to the original values as well. And in terms of frequency distribution, you need to know how to build the frequency distribution, the rules that are the, 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 the properties of building a frequency distribution, which is a summary table for numerical data. You need to be able to know how to interpret your histogram, how to build the histogram, how to build a frequency polygon or a cumulative frequency polygon, which is also called an OGIF. In study unit three, we learned about the measurement in terms of numerical data. That how do we summarize the data by means of two ways of, or three ways. The measures of central uh, location, measures of variation and the quantile. In terms of measures of central location, you need to always remember those three measures of central location that we talk about. The mean, the median and the mode when we talk about the measures of variation and you need to know how to define them and how to calculate them or how to find them. The measures of variation, you need to know how to calculate or find the range, the, um, the variance, the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation as well. And also going back to the median, remember with the median, you first need to find the position after you have ordered your data from lowest to highest and then find the position and where it falls, uh, the position falls, that's what the median is. And if the position is between two values, you take the average of the two. You need to be able to know how to interpret your standard deviation for some reason, uh, not always, but how to calculate them and how to calculate the coefficient of variation. And remember some of this, you can use your calculator if you are given the data and put your calculator on a state mode zero and just capture the data and calculate your mean, your variance, your standard deviation, and you can also do your coefficient of variation. When it comes to the quartiles, you must also remember that the quartiles breaks down your data after you have sorted the data from lowest to highest into four parts where you will have Quartile 1, Quartile 2, Quartile 3, which represent Quartile 1 represent 25% of 25% of your data falls below that. And your Quartile 2, which is the same as your median, and your Quartile 3, it tells you that 75% of the data falls below that, or 25% of the data falls above, above that. But you also, not but actually, you need to also remember that with a quart with the quartiles, you <laughs> you need to find the position, and from the position, you need to find the value. Using the value, you can calculate what we call the interquartile range, which is your Q3 value minus your Q1 value. 
and you can also visualize the quartiles by using a box whisker plot box and whisker plot which gives you the five number summary the smallest quartal one quartal two quartal three and the maximum values okay when it comes to the probabilities i just want to come here you need to be able to remember that probabilities are always between zero and one and a complement of a probability is that probability that is not from the original one but it is part of the sample space and you also need to know that the sum of all probabilities should always equals to one and you need to know that to calculate the probability of a simple event we use the probab x divided by n, which is the number satisfying that event divided by how many there are, which are your sample space. The joint probabilities, if they didn't tell you anything about independence and so on, you need to always remember that joint events of probabilities are number satisfying that joint event divided by the sample space. You also need to know how to calculate the additional rule. Remember now, in the exam or in any way, they will not tell you calculate the additional rule. You need to be able to read the question and identify that this is your additional rule because they will tell you that you need to calculate the probability of A or B or either one event happening or another event happening. And that is the additional rule and that is given by the probability if i have event a and b it will be given by the probability of a plus the probability of b minus the joint probability of a and b and remember that if events are mutually exclusive therefore it means they cannot affect one another then the probability of a joint event will be equals to zero and if that is the case then the probability of event a or b happening will be equals to the probability of A plus B for mutually exclusive events. You also need to know how to calculate the conditional probability. That is the probability of an event given that another event had already occurred. And that is how, uh, what you need to always remember. And that the probability of A given B is given by the joint probability of A and B divided by the probability of a given, which will be B. And if they tell you that event A and B are independent, therefore, the probability of A given B will be the same as the probability of A because B is independent from A, whatever, even whether B has already happened before, has no effect on what is going to happen on A. Hence, the probability of A given B will be the same as the probability of A because the event A and event B are independent. You also need to know the multiplication rule that if you are given the conditional probability, which is the probability that an event A given B had happened, and they ask you to find the probability of A and B, you must know that now you are dealing with conditional probability, but it is a multiplication rule. Therefore, the probability of A and B will be given by the conditional probability of A given B times the probability of a given, unless if they tell you that the probability of A and B are independent. Therefore, because we know that if they are independent, the given probability will be the same as that probability that we want to find, then the probability of A and B will be the same as the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Because the given probability of A given B for event A and B being independent is the same as the probability of A, then the probability of A given B, it's equal to the probability of A and B will be given by the probability of A times the probability of B. And that is the basic probabilities. So these are the things that 
are easy to find and calculate. I'm gonna assume. Remember also for the probabilities, you can represent your probabilities by means of using a contingency table where inside the table you will have what we call your joint probabilities and outside the table where you calculate your totals, you will have what we call the marginal probabilities or your simple probabilities. And this grand total will be equals to your sample space or you also need to always remember that probabilities are given to you in decimals, events are given to you in whole numbers. So you need to be able to identify those things in the question that this is probabilities and this is events so that then you know how to handle the question as well. So moving to the activities that you said you struggled with, which you highlighted that sometimes you struggle with your um, uh, discrete probabilities. There are two things in between probabilities and then three things. Discrete probabilities is made up of three things. As always remember that it is your proper properties of a discrete probability. Where you will be given a table with X and its corresponding probabilities. You remember that, right? Then you have also what is called a binomial. And you have a Poisson. So with binomial and Poisson, two ways. In the exam, usually they don't ask you to use the, the formula to calculate, but you need to know how to use the formula for Poisson to find the probability of divided by n is given by the combination rule times the probability times one minus the probability of n minus x. So that is finding the probability of a binomial. Otherwise, you need to be able to use the table. And remember the table has the left hand side values and the top probabilities and the bottom probabilities and the right values. Remember that, right? That the top side probabilities from 0 to 50, 0, point, 0 to 0 0.5, you will find the value by using your n and your x from the left-hand side. If you find the probability uh, that it is between uh, six, 0 0.6 or 0 0.55 to 0. Uh, nine, nine, then you need to use the bottom part and read the value of your n and your x from the left hand side or the right hand side. For a poison as well, the probability of x is equals to uh, your e to the power lambda or minus lambda times your x, uh, your lambda to the power of x, you need to be able to calculate that, divide by your x factorial. You need to be able to calculate that probability by using that. Otherwise, then you will need to use your table where your table is divided by the lambda value and the value of your n and x, or your x actually, not your n, because with the poison, you do not have an X. You need to be able to know how to find and navigate between the two. Now, in terms of this at a high level, this is straightforward and easy to do, but there are certain things that you always also need to be able to calculate. You should be able to calculate the expected value of a discrete probability. Uh, the expected value of a discrete probability is calculated by the sum of your x times the sum, the probabilities. So it means you need to multiply and add all your x times its corresponding probabilities and add them together. 
you also are expected to know how to calculate the standard deviation of a discrete probability, which is all the variance, which is the square root of the sum of your x minus your probability, your x minus your expected value, not your probability, your x minus your expected value squared times its corresponding probability. Remember, whatever it's underneath the square root, it is your variance. This is your variance, which is sigma squared. You need to be able to know how to calculate each and every one of them. You also are expected to know how to calculate the expected value, which is your n times the probability for a binomial or the, uh, the standard deviation, which is the square root of your n times the probability times one minus the probability. And remember, anything underneath the square root is the same as your variance. You are also expected to know how to calculate the expected value of the poison, which is the same as your lambda, and which is the same as your, which is the same as your variance sigma squared. Therefore, your standard deviation, you must know that it is the square root of your lambda. You should be able to calculate all that. On top of everything else, remember the signs. How do we calculate the probability, which I should have done it when I gave you the formula. How do we calculate the probability? You always need to remember that at least, what does that mean? At most, what does that mean? Less than, what does that mean? Greater than, what does that mean? And between, what does that mean? And when it's between inclusive and exclusive, what does that mean? So you need to be able to know all that in terms in with relate uh, with regards to the side, the mathematical side, that at least it's greater than or equal and if you are going to use a formula, therefore it means you will have to use this formula multiple times to find the at least. Because if it says it's greater than, and if your n, if your n was was five and they say x is greater than three, therefore it means four and five will be included when sorry if they say it's greater than or equals to three three four and five so it means this formula you will calculate for three you'll calculate for four you will calculate for five so you need to know how to use the equations or the mathematical formula uh, functions uh, at most is less than or equal less than greater than between exclusive and inclusive ex uh, inclusive it means it will have the both equalities uh, if it's inclusive of a value. Um, exclusive, it will have a a less um, uh, the less than. So it will depend because based on it can either be it's inclusive and exclusive, or it can be exclusive and inclusive so depending you need to be able to know and identify what each one mean in terms of that um and how do we find uh each one of them as well and still remember bring back the study unit four content that you've learned the probabilities so let's look at uh i just want to open a uh, share my entire screen as well so I can just open I think I can open a let's let's open a table. 
so that we can go to the tables. And we can look at one exercise, sorry. Since it's one of the things that you guys are struggling with, let's look at that in detail. I'm gonna share my entire screen instead of. Okay, so yeah, I've got 2020 tutorial letter. I just wanna go through one of the questions that deals with. Uh, with boy I know me. Okay, so this is one of the questions. So yeah, we have Autism South Africa has found that 50% of the people with autism disorder struggle with social interaction. Assume we randomly select six people living with ASD and use the information given to answer the following question. So always remember, when you deal with binomial distribution as well, uh, I'm not gonna touch on discrete probabilities because this is one of those questions that I'm assuming that you guys by now know how to do that one. So I'm going to the table. Um, directly uh, to the question. So when you get a question that it reads like this, where they only give you one percentage and they ask you questions, but also in the exam, you will be able to identify that now you are in this type of a question. You will see your exam questions are in an order of your study units. They are not going to be randomized the way you get um, a study unit 10 in question two and then study unit uh, three in question 50. No, they follow the structure of your chap your study unit chapters. So the first few questions will come for the first, if they are uh, two to two questions per chapter, the first two questions will come from study units one. The first, second two questions will come from study unit two, like that, like that, like that. And that is, you need to be able to uh, identify that when I read this question and I see these things, I know which question or which study unit this comes from. For example, like this one. So this you can immediately put there. That is your probability of success, which means it is binomial and we can answer the question. And the other thing that they give you here is your N. And in the question, they will give you your X. And immediately when you read the question, what is the probability that only three people with ASD will struggle with social interaction? You can just write there on your note the probability because they say that only then it is equal, which is exactly. Um, and then three, therefore, you can either use the formula or you can go and calculate using the table, which is easier on the table. With the formula, you will have to calculate NCR and we use X and CX. One minus and minus X. So you will have to say six, three times 0 0.5. To the power three times one minus zero point five to the power six minus minus three and go and calculate that calculation. Otherwise, you go to the table. So the question there is zero point five. So it means I can find it at the top of the table. So when you go to the table, you go look for binomial probabilities. And that is the table, and I can just update it. And that is my table, and there is 0 0.5 at the top. And I must just look for N of 6, and there is my N of 6. 
and the probability is x so i must just go and look for three x is three and that line and the answer will be that and that's how straightforward it would be if you have your tables and the answer will just be option three you can also take your calculator and calculate the same and it, it will also get come to the same conclusion um Auslesi, sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you there mm -hmm. so if it had said that um x is greater than three let's go there here is your question what is the probability that at most person with ASD will struggle with social interaction. Remember your N is 6 and your pi is 0 0.5. What is at most? That's um, less than or equal to. So therefore it means we need to find the probability that X is less than or equals to what? then it means we need to find the probability that x is equals to zero plus the probability that x is equals to one. So if I'm going to use the formula, you will use six and c r is zero. Maybe I should put the formula down instead of substituted values and see x by x one minus pi and minus x plus and c r c x pi x one minus pi minus x so you will need to do both add them together. So if there were three, you will do the same. You have to go and find all three of them and add them together. If there were four, you will do the same. Substitute six zero zero point five one minus. 0 0.5, 6 minus 0, plus 6, 1, times 0 0.5 to the power 1, times 1 minus 0 0.5 to the power 6 minus 1. And you will solve that. Otherwise, you go to the table. We're looking for one and two. So you go, sorry, zero and one, which are the two, two values there. 0 0.015 and 0 0.093. 0 0.0156 plus 0 0.0937. You add them together. What is the answer? Six plus seven, 13. Three plus five is eight plus one is nine. Nine plus one is 10, 31. And the answer is, oops, sorry. And the answer is I write it here on the side. And the answer is zero point one zero nine three, which is option one. That's how you will answer the question. So looking at poison, uh, so you should be able to also 
be able to answer this type of a question, your expected value for the same question and the variance. Remember, I've showed you the formulas on how to calculate each one of them. Remember those formulas. You should be able to calculate them. Remember, everything underneath the square root is your sigma squared. So you will use all three formulas to answer this question. Uh, OK, let's move to Poison. Um, uh, who asked the question? Chantel, you the one who said you were still struggling with how to use these tables, or was it you? I, I can't even remember who was yeah. that. Yes. Me. Yes. So <clears throat> are they making am, am I making it easier for you or is it still confusing? Right. So that question that you just answered now when you used the formula, would you still be able to answer that question by looking at the table? Yes. Remember this. Yeah. Is how you would have found it on the on the formula. Mm -hmm. If in the exam, what I I, I can tell you is in the exam, try by all means to stay away from using formulas. Yeah. Use the table because for poison, for that it so. saves you time. As you can see that instead of me taking my calculator and writing out this, mm. I could have just wrote this step, which is the probability of X is equal to zero, plus the probability of X is equals to one and go to the table and found those values because that's what I did. I went to the table and I found those two values and I came here and wrote them here, even though mm -hmm. I wrote the formulas like that. You are not going to be marked on how did you find the, the answer, right? Okay. You are not expected to show how you calculated it. You're just going to pick if the answer is one, two, three, or four, or the answer is A, B, C, or D. That's the only thing that matters. So use save time by using tables. They create shortcuts uh, and they save you time to spend it on other things as well. OK, so. This is binomial. For poison, it will be similar. So in the exam, you will recognize it because there will be only one question from poison, so you will not have a lot. You'll have uh, usually ha because um, you're you're writing um, out of twenty five. Like the possibilities are, you have twenty five questions, right? Of those twenty five questions, you have eleven study units. Of the eleven study units, therefore, if there will be two questions per study unit then it means you will be having 22 questions. You are short of three questions. There are some places where there are, it, it, you will be forced to have three questions per study unit. And one of those is the binomial. Because with binomial, you deal with discrete poison. Sorry, it's, it's, that is discrete probabilities. In discrete probability, you deal with discrete binomial and poison. In chi-squared, you deal with three things. Chi-squared, when the population standard deviation is known, when the population standard deviation is unknown, and for the proportion, there are three. In hypothesis testing, you deal with three questions, three statements. The same way, when the population is known, when it's unknown, population standard deviation, and the proportion. So there are three. So binomial, you might get Oh, sorry, discrete, you might get three questions. Uh, confidence interval, three questions. Hypothesis testing, three questions. That will make out uh, 25. But that does not mean it will always be like that because study unit one, two, three, they always almost are similar. In terms of questions, they can be mixed up in those three, uh, six or four questions from that. and. That might mean that you might get three questions from either or three questions from either study unit. Um, three way we deal with measures because you also have remember not only 
uh, central tendency, you have uh, the measures of variation and you have your quartiles as well and so on. So please pay attention to those kind of things as well. But moving on to uh, Poisson. So in Poisson, you will know when you got the binomial, the next thing is Poisson. And in Poisson, they talk about the mean and they always can also specify that this is a Poisson. Including also with binomial, they might specify that this is a binomial and that will give you an indication of where you are. So the minute they talk about the poison and they give you the mean, you must know that that is your lambda. And also you can either use formula or you can use <coughs> the table to find the probability. What is the probability that on any given day, a neuropsychologist will consult with only one adult? And also they is still that keyword only. So if that is the only, then it's equal. Therefore, x is equals to one. And they're asking you to find the probability that x is equals to one. Now, in the exam, they might not or they might. You must pay attention to the information given to you. So on this one, they expect you to also at least know how to use your formula. So we can write the formula. Remember, the formula is um, looking at how the option on here is, I'm going to use the option. Uh, they said it's lambda x times e to the power of minus lambda divided by x factorial. That is the formula. Otherwise, you can go to the table. So let's go to the table. We're going to find a poison. There is our poison table, and we're looking for the 1.5 as our average. It will be on the in the lambda values, and we are looking for x is equals to one, and x is equals to one. We go to one, and the answer is 0, 0.3347. Coming here you can see that the answer is not there. Don't select this and say maybe it's a typing error. The answer is not there, therefore it means the next best thing is let's substitute the values onto the formula. So our lambda is 1.5, our x is one, our e times minus our lambda of 1.5 divided by our x is one factorial. Hey, as you can see, there it is your answer. Exactly the same way. Okay. So you need to be you need to be able to recognize things that are given, make decision quickly because in the exam you also don't have time to contemplate and, and, and do a lot of things. You just need to go in there being prepared for different scenarios that could happen because they might also not give you questions like this to calculate the probability. They might ask you to explain poison um, or they might ask you to calculate uh, the mean of poison or this, the variance or something like that. So you should be able to know how to. So let's look at the next one. So we know that our lambda is 1.5. What is at least you need to be able to know what is the probability that on any given day a neuropsychologist will consult with at least seven adults. So they is. What is at least greater than or equal? So it means you need to go the probability that X is greater than or equals to seven. Immediately before you even start typing there, go to the table and look at the table. So let's go there. The probability of lambda of five. 
Where is seven? Seven is there. The rest is eight. Go there and look at the values. So it means I must take all that. So it's up to nine. Remember that with Poison, the challenge with Poison mm -hmm. is for every lambda value, I'll be there. For every lambda value, the table changes, right? So you can see from 1.1 to 2.0, your X value ends at nine. For the next one, if the if it was 2.5, the lambda value, the X value ends at 12. So you need to pay attention to that. So you need seven, eight, nine. So because on the chances are on here because they don't tell you your n value. So you all know whether you need to find the probability that x is equals to seven. That's the probability x is equals to eight plus the probability x is equals to nine. Because you would have went on and on and on and on if you didn't know uh, to calculate. So then you will need to go and use the formula if you want to use the formula. I'm not going to use the formula on this one, the probability that x is equals to a value. We know that it is given by the lambda to the power x, e to the power minus lambda divided by x factorial. Do you have any question? Justice I, or someone? I yeah, Yes. Yes, it's Liz. It is, it is me. Right. Can you go back to this table, please? Because I I struggle on the table. Yes. Uh, so this is the table. You say when we start by looking at it, you we look at you mark the seven there. And uh, yeah, on the on the vertical line, on zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. Then you went to there, and it, it is the under the lambda there. Mm -hmm. Yes, can you explain how, how do you mark it? Because I was I'm struggling. Okay, so we are given, we are told what our lambda is, right? Is one point one point seven. We are also told that we need to find the probability that x is greater than seven. So you go to where seven is. And we know that it is greater than, so it means anything bigger than seven. So I went and I highlighted. Let's remove the ink. I think I can remove it this way. So I had already highlighted where my lambda is. So I went and I go to seven because that is where I need to start. And I highlight where the values are, and those are the values that I must be interested in. Just, it's seven, eight, nine, and I wrote here the probability of seven, the probability of eight, and the probability of nine, which is 0 0.08 and 0 0.001. So you just say it's 0 0.008. Plus 0 0.000. That's how you will identify your answer. And the answer is 0 0.0009. It is as straightforward as that. So if they would have said it's less than seven, I would have done the same. But instead of highlighting all three of them, I would have only highlighted the two. So because it says it's at, at least, at least means greater than or equal. So it includes seven and anything bigger than seven. Okay, this is Lizzie, thank you. Okay. Um, so, I was Lizzie. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you there. For, for 1501, mm -hmm. our tables, they are cumulative, right? Your table is cumulative. Okay. That's the other thing. And I don't have your table. How possible that I don't have your table? Your table is cumulative. So you probably at this point 
on your table, you are on 0 0.0099, where x is 7. And at that point where x is 8, you are 0 0.0092. On on my table for eight. for seven, it's zero point nine 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 eight. You have five decimals. No four. four. Um, point point nine 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 eight. Hmm. Zero point nine nine. Nine eight. Zero point nine nine eight. Um, in Are you sure? There won't be a zero. Are you sure? Yes, you have for this. Please read them again. Wait, my bad. I might be writing them wrong. Let's do this. So on seven you have zero point zero nine. Uh, no zero, just nine. Zero point nine. Oh, because it's cumulative, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh. So it's zero point nine. Nine nine. Another nine. And eight. Nine nine. On under 1.5, not under 1.9. Yes, ma'am. So on 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 eight, what do you have then? And so on then eight is one. Let's say zero point one, and then on six, zero point nine. And then on six, nine 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 one. Another nine and one. Nine, nine and one. Okay, so on your one, because you have both of those seven and six, and we're looking for any value greater than. So we need to subtract. You need to subtract that value to that so that you can get the value. But this is 100. So probably you need to take 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.9991. You will need to take the one before this value from 6. So you will say. 1 minus the probability that x is equals to 6 for you to be able to get the probability of x greater than or equals to 7. What do you get when you subtract 0 0.9991? You should have the same as what we have. Yes, it's the same. So you need to be able to know how to read your table of your cumulative table. Uh, <clears throat> so therefore it means uh, for you, you need to know that if you are on one, one includes the previous value plus that. When you are on two, it includes all three of them. And if you need to only find the probability of two, you will need to take your last value on two and subtract the value on one so that you can get the actual value for two and should give you the same. So you need to be able to read your table properly. And probably when we when we when we have a session on your exam prep, we can use your own table to explain because I think the challenge with these sessions I use most of the time the 1610 um 
content because that's what I have at my disposal as an e Twitter for 1610. And I always forget about 1501. I must take note of that. Okay. We'll do that when we do the exam prep. May I ask one more question? Mm -hmm, you can. If 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 it's x greater than or equals to four, would it be correct then to say one minus x less than or equals to three? Uh, Since no. the tables are cumulative. If the table, yes, if if the table are cumulative, you will say you will do that. So you, for example, you will take, you will do the same thing as, as this. If X is greater than or equals to four, then you will say one minus, one minus. The, the value of three. That X is equals to three. So you will always take the one above. But if uh -huh. your question is, it's less than, or equals at most less than or equals to four. Therefore, for you, it will just be the probability of X is equals to four for a less than or equal. Right. So if if your question was the probability that X is less than or equal because your table is already accumulative, you just take the value you see on four. But if it says it is less than four on your table, then it will be different. You need to treat it different. So if the question is the probability that X is less than four, then on your table, it will not be equals to uh, four. It will be the probability of X equals to three for a less than. Because it's cumulative. When you are at three, it includes three, two, one, and zero. Right? Oh, yes, I see that. Thank you. You see that. Cool, 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 cool. And if they ask you that, find the probability that X is equals to four, then that's when you can say the probability of X equals to four minus the probability of X equals to three, so that you can get the actual value for four. So you take the value at where you want, minus the previous value. That will give you the difference, which will be your actual value that you are looking for. So you just need to know how, we can look at the scenarios at a later stage, but you can play around and see if you get it from your side. So that is um, the study unit five. So I can imagine that we are still at study unit five. So let's look at the other question you asked was, you struggle, um, and I think this comes from you, from justice as well, because for you, you say you don't know whether when you have a less than and with justice says he doesn't also know um, which side, the lower side or the upper side or something like that. So how do we then do normal distribution? So remember, now we are in study unit. Study unit. Six, which is normal distribution. So now with normal distribution, there are a couple of things that you always need to remember. You have the probability of Z less than a value. And if the you need to find that, you will find the value on the table. You also have the probability that Z is greater than a value, regardless of what value is a negative or positive, it doesn't matter. Then you will have to always say one minus the value you find on the table. For the probability of Z lies between two values, A and B, Whichever value they are, you will always say the table value for B minus the table value for A. And that's how you will find the probabilities. Also, remember the Z value. If they didn't give it to you as Z value, you will need to find the Z value by calculating your X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And that is 
what you need to be doing. The other one, which I'm going to include with the study unit six, because these are the, the basic things that you need to know. It's study unit seven. Which study unit seven, which is um, sampling distribution. So with sampling distribution, the same concept because we calculate in the Z, right? It will be the same. And remember also the equal sign, it doesn't really matter that much with the with this two. Only when we deal with hypothesis testing, then the equal sign, the at least, the greater than, the at most, those equal sign from those, the equal and um, the less than an equal sign will matter when we do only hypothesis. When we deal with normal distribution or sampling distribution, they do not matter that much. Whether you use the less than, the greater than, you will still get the same answer. So with, with sampling distribution, there are a couple of things that you need to, to, um, to, 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 to remember and do. So here we have two scenarios that can happen. You will do for the mean, For the mean or for the proportion, right? But all of them you will be calculating the Z. So if I'm calculating the Z value for the mean, it will be your sample mean minus your population mean divided by the standard error. No. Divide by the standard error. So remember, this is your standard error, which is called the sampling distribution a standard deviation, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of A. If you're calculating it for the proportion, then you will have your sample proportion minus your population proportion divided by the standard error, which is your population proportion one minus the population proportion divided by N. Divide by n. All of them, they use z, 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 z. You just need to calculate the z accordingly, and then use to find the probability. Use the table to find the probability. So we're going to look at all three of them because in the exam as well, you will have normal distribution, and immediately after normal distribution, the minute they start mentioning the sample size, then you know that you're doing. The, the sampling distribution. So let's look at how the questions look. Uh, since even this is not the exam, but you just need to be able to know how to move from one to the other. And usually keywords like normal distribution will give you an insight in terms of whether are you now in with the normal distributions. Okay, so this one, lucky for us, we don't have to calculate any Z. So this is the question. Find the probability that Z is greater than or equals to negative 2.88. Irregardless of whether it was a negative or a positive, we do not even worry about that because that tells us which table site we need to go to. The sign is just tell you which site. That's it. The greater than or equal tells you how. How are you going to find it? And the how part, it is this. This is the use, which is the how. The how, right? The how is how are you going to find from which side of the table? So let's let's look at that. Which side? The negative tells us. Which side? We need to go to the normal distribution table, which is called the cumulative standardized normal distribution. And I guess you all have the same table. It's called cumulative standardized normal distribution. If it just says standard normal distribution table, don't use that one because it's not the same as this. It needs to say cumulative. Okay, so now we know that we need to be on the negative side. And remember, it's negative 2.8. Eight. So the two we will find on the site, and the eight we will find it 
at the top. Right? So that's what we know. Minus 2.8, and there it is. And at the top, we need to just find the last digit. Always remember the last digit, two decimals, last digit at the top. Where they both meet, that's the value that we're looking for. That is. Excuse me. Yes, sorry. May I please what ask you to, sh to share that this table on the group, if you can? But this table is part of the notes. I've shared it on the notes. On the notes. Okay, I'm going to look for it. Yes. Thank you. So if I. Uh, If you want me because to share it via here, let me stop right here. And because then I need to go into my. I was thinking about printing for the exams because sometimes the, the P value, it's the Z value is large and our tables don't go beyond three. No, in the exam, they won't give you values that are not on the table. Oh, okay. They, they okay. won't Thank give you things that are outside of that. So you just need to look at what you have on your. For some reason, I cannot attach a document on. No, that is all right if they won't ask anything bigger. Yeah, no, I cannot attach a document on on here, yeah, only a link. I can only add a link, but not a document. So yeah, but anyway, they are on the on the notes section. If you go to the schedule thing where you get the recordings, you will get the okay. the, the same table. Uh, this is Lizzie. Mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as I indicated last week that my phone got lost, then I have done a swim swap. So how can I, 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 it is not possible for me to access schedule three. It's not possible for you to access the? The schedule three because I, I, I my phone was lost. Then last week I had to do swim swap. Oh. Okay, I'll send the link on the on the um I will resend the, the link for the recordings again. Thank you, sis Liz. Sorry, for some reason the table doesn't wanna open. It closed, I don't know how. Oh, it was just like somewhere on the site. My bet. Okay. Okay, so we were looking for. Two point eight, which is zero point zero zero two zero, which is option one. Okay, let's look at the between. Between minus one point. One and one point nine. So remember, the value we will find on the table for one point nine minus the value you will find on the table for minus one point 
one. And because this R, one decimal, you can just add a zero to the end so that you know that you're going to use the top first column. You will use that column. So since I'm on the minus side, we can look for 1.1 1. 1 and 0. So just write that value. It's 0 0.153 for the second one. 0 0.1. But now one three five seven one three five seven and for one point nine we go to the positive side and we look for one point nine one point nine and zero which is nine seven one three. 0 0.9713 and you take the difference. What is the answer? 0 0.8356, option three. And that's how you will find the value, regardless of whether, can you see now, whether the value is negative or positive, you you should be able to go to the table and write the same concept. This, the A is any value, it can be negative or positive. Remember, the negative or the positive tells you how, uh, sorry, tells you where, because it tells you whether are you going to the positive side of the table or are you going to the negative side of the table. The how you're going to find the value is based on the sign. The negative, the positive, it doesn't matter. So don't get confused with the bigger side and the less the, and the smaller side, because this tells you that this is the bigger probability of the less than value. So if the value of Z is less than this, this is the bigger side of it. Because if it's positive, because it's on the positive side, it will be those values. If it's negative Z value, because you can see that it's always there. If it's negative, it will be the smaller side of the thing, but also, this doesn't also discard this. It's a smaller side from the greater than. Hence, you take one minus that value when we deal with the greater than to get the smaller portion. And the same thing, if I need to deal with the greater than of a negative value, you will take one minus the uh, this value to get the bigger portion. So. Don't get caught up with, this is the smaller side, this is the bigger side. Just remember, the negative or the positive just tells you which, which table are you going to be using. The only thing you need to worry about is the greater than sign or the less than sign, or if it's between. Okay, so moving on, we almost 30 minutes, almost to the end of the session. So let's see if we can get to some other study units. So now let's move to study unit eight, which is confidence interval. So with confidence interval, you have three things that you need to worry about. The confidence interval for the mean when the population standard deviation is known, or when the population standard deviation is unknown, or for the proportions. So when the population standard deviation is known, therefore we use the point estimate plus or minus 
the Z critical value of alpha divided by two times the standard error, which is standard deviation divided by the square root of N. When the population standard deviation is unknown, we use the point estimate plus or minus the critical value of alpha divided by two and the degrees of freedom, which is N minus one and your standard error. For the proportion, we use the point estimate plus or minus the critical value, which will be alpha divided by two times the standard error, which is given by the sampling proportions. Now, if your P is not given, we know that we can use your value, uh, the number satisfying divided by N. How do we find the critical value? You find the critical value on the table. Now, this is where it's very, very important to keep note of the following. A Z value of 0. Let me not do it that way. A confidence interval of 95% interval. You need to know that the critical value of Z alpha divided by 2 for, the, for it is the same as 1.96. For a 90%, you need to know that that is the one exception that we have. The critical value will be 1.6 for it. For a 99, it will be 2.33. For A98, it will be 2.58. I might have the numbers vice versa. Let me double check. I think the 90% is 45, 645. Yes, 645. I wrote 8. Why did I, where do I get 8 from? Uh, this two, I might have the numbers vice versa. I must just double check. Yeah, you got it swapped. 99 is 258. And 98 is three. It's one. Yeah. 98 is 2.33. And 99 is 258. Yeah. There we go. Yes. So you, you just need to remember that. That is for confidence interval. It's easy to always remember all these three. But usually they use that. All this, those are the two that they will use um, mostly in the exam, but the majority of the time, this one with the big dot, 95%, they love it, love it, love it. Um, so therefore, it means you should be able to find that. And remember, the plus or minus is the same thing as finding the lower limit and the upper limit. So if they ask you to find the lower limit, you just use the minus, the critical value times the standard error. And that's, that's all you need to, to always remember, just to substitute the values and know that you're calculating the lower limit or the upper limit and find that. And always remember the critical value. The only critical value that it's not going to be, is, be easy to memorize and know that you need, definitely you need to go and calculate or find that critical value, it's for T. Mm -hmm. So for, for Z, for the proportion, and for when the population standard deviation is known, those two, it's fairly easy if you can remember that. This, you will have to go and find it on the table. So if they gave you a 95% confidence interval and your N was 24 or 25, let's assume that 25, so that then I can do um, a 0 0.05 divided by two, which is 0 0.025, therefore, your T value of alpha divided by two will be 0 0.025. And your degrees of freedom, which is your N minus one, which will be 25 minus one, which is 24, will be given by, you just go to the table and look for that critical value. 
So how do we find the critical value? You go to the T table. And always remember on the T table not to use the cumulative value, only use the upper tail values. And we're looking for 0, 0.025. Always remember your alpha value is divided by, by 2. 0, 0.025 and you go and look for 24 where they both meet. That is where your critical value is which is 2,0639. Also remember that a 95% confidence interval is the same as uh, 0, 0,95 is equals to 1 minus alpha. And what is important is to find your alpha value, which is 1 minus 0, 0,95, which is the same as 0, 0,05. And I use 0 0.05 there. So you just need to know and remember all those things as well. How to find your alpha value from given the confidence interval. So let's look at an example, at least one of them. So now we were in the normal distribution. Um, we didn't do a whole lot of activities on that. But for example, if uh, you want to know how do you move from a normal distribution to a sampling distribution. In your question, they would give you uh, things like the samples, because this is still the normal distribution where they will ask you to find the probability. But I want to go to the one way. They give you your N. There you go. So they say the mean is that, the sample size is that, and the mean is between, and also keywords like sample mean and all that. So that is what we did previously. So, but we want to go to the confidence intervals. So with confidence intervals, With confidence interval, they will tell you that a confidence interval this or confidence interval that, things like this, they might give you to use so that you can compare and say which value is which. And we did this in most of the activities, but I want to go to the one way you need to be calculating. Um, it's a massive like, here we go, there we go. There we go. So yeah, it's a question. Mawa to a scientist to get a random sample of 30 adults and found that the reading time is normally distributed with the sample mean and sample standard deviation. That is the other thing that you always need to remember. How do you identify whether the population standard deviation is given or whether the sample standard or the population standard deviation is unknown? It's keywords like this, sample standard deviation. Then you, you know that you're going to use T. If they gave you sample mean and population standard deviation, then you need to know that you're going to use Z. Um, how do you identify whether it's the proportion? Sometimes they will tell you that a sample proportion, you will know those things. So now let's, <clears throat> let's find this confidence interval. The mean plus or minus, we know that we're doing T alpha divided by two and degrees of freedom times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So we can go and find our t alpha, and here they told us it is 99%. Do you still remember 99% is 2.58? Ah, 2.58. But that is not the case, because this is t. You will do that in the exam. You will get it wrong. Don't do that to yourself. So it's 99. If it's T, remember, it's not something that you can always remember. We need to go and find it, which 99 is the same as 0, 0,01 divided by 2. And our degrees of freedom will be 30 minus 1. Our T of 0, 0,01, what is? It's 0, 0, 
is it zero five or zero zero five? Zero comma zero zero five. Zero comma zero zero five and twenty nine. Let's go find this critical value. So zero comma zero zero five and nine and twenty nine. 0, 0, it's the last column, and 29. It's 2,7564. 2, 2,7564. Then you can substitute into the formula. Our mean, which is our X bar, our S and our N. So our mean of 90 plus or minus our critical value, 2,7564 times standard deviation, 18 divided by the square root of 30. Can also have just expanded it. 90 minus 2,7564 times 18 divided by the square root of 30. And 90 plus 2,7564 times 18 divided by the square root of 30. And you go and calculate the answer and that is the confidence intervals let me use my calculator as well unfortunately i didn't open mine online Do you have an answer? For the lower value, it's 80.94. For the upper value, it's 99. Zero five eight four. Nine nine point zero five eight four. I'm gonna assume that that was that should have been the answer. And that would be how you would have answered. Um, you would answer the question and identify certain things. So I just want to get to the other sections and then we should be done because some of them we just covered them not so long ago. Okay, so the next uh, last two chapters, let me just remember now. We dealt with confidence interval, and the next one is hypothesis testing. Hypothesis, hypothesis testing, and with hypothesis testing as well, three things. When the population standard deviation is known, and when it is unknown, when the population standard deviation is unknown, or for the proportions. So with hypothesis testing, remember all seven, six steps. State your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Always remember the null hypothesis always has 
the equality side. The alternative hypothesis, it can state that it's less than, or it's greater than, or it's not less than. All these are what we call a one-tail test. They help us develop which side of the rejection area will that be. This is a two-tail test. Right? So those are the signs that can go on today. And always use the population parameter. So for the population for where the population mean is known, we use the mean, we use the mean, and for this one, we use the proportion when we state the null hypothesis, right? This is when we state the null hypothesis. We always use the population parameter. Step number two. We need to determine what is given. What is given in the question? You need to be able to identify your alpha value, your n, and whether the population standard deviation is known or unknown. So things like that. And if, for example, it's for the uh, proportions, if they didn't give you your p, you need to be able to calculate your p over n there. Um, if it is, um, yeah, only that. Uh, and then step number three, we need to state what type of a test statistic we are going to be doing. So yeah, you just say it is Z, it is Z test, or it is a T test, or it is a Z test. That's all what you need to do stating the state, the test statistic. Step number four is to find the region of rejection. Which is also called the critical values. So remember, <clears throat> the critical values also dependent on the side. So for less than, your critical value or your region of rejection will be on the left hand side. Anything that falls here, you reject the null hypothesis. For a greater than, it will be on the right hand side. Anything that falls here, you reject the null hypothesis. Whether it's for the T or the Z, you do the same. For a not equal, the rejection area, it is on both sides. Anything that falls here, you reject H0. Anything that falls here, you reject H0. That is the step number four. You need to find the critical value. And remember now, finding the critical value for one directional, for a Z, for a less than, or for a greater than, the critical value will be Z alpha or Z alpha. For a two-tail test, it will be Z alpha divided by two. For a T, it will be the same. T alpha, T alpha, and T alpha divided by two, and don't forget the degrees of freedom. And for Z, it will be the same as the first one. Step number four is to calculate the test statistic. You need to be able to calculate your test statis, statistics. So therefore, it means here you will need to calculate the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Or for t, you need to be the population mean minus the population standard deviation. Oh, the sample mean minus the population mean divide by the standard error, which is your sample standard deviation. For the proportion, you need to be able to calculate your Z, P minus the population proportion, divide by the standard error. And last but not least, you need to make, you need to make a decision and conclude. How do we make a decision? Making the decision based on the critical value and 
the region of rejection. If it falls in the region of rejection on the left stand, you reject, otherwise you do not. And you state it back in relation to your null hypothesis. Right. The other thing you need to always remember as well is the p-value, which is the other thing that you guys asked about. How do we make decision based on the p-value? Now, also with the p-value, also remember the following. For the less than, we'll start there. Remember, you calculate first the test statistic. So the same concept that you have applied on the other side. If your z value so for the less than we start there if your alternative hypothesis was less than then it means the test statistics that you are calculating there is the less than test statistic now if it is the less than statistic therefore the value you find on the table that is your p value Irregardless of whether you find it on the negative side or on the positive side, right? The value you find on the table, that is your p value. That is for a one sided test. What about when it is greater than? Irregardless as well, if really irregardless regardless the value you find on the table you will use the value you find on the table will be one minus the table value and that will be your p value So you will subtract the value you find on the table and that will give you your p-value, regardless of whether it's on the negative or on the positive. The only difference it is when it is not equal. Now, when it is not equal, so you will have to pay attention to what the sign you put on your alternative. This is very important. It's very, very important, this step, the alternative. So when it is not equal, now, this is where the negative side of the table and the positive side of the table comes into play. When the sign says not equal and your Z value is negative, when the Z value is negative and the alternative hypothesis is not equal, therefore, your p-value will be equals to two times the table value. So it means the value you will find on the table, you will use that value to and multiply it by two to get to the p-value. Or you can say table value plus table value. You can add it to itself twice. If your Z value is positive, then your P value will be equals to two times one minus the value you're going to find on the table. Because remember the table, the the p-value contains the probability of greater than, right? Of, sorry, of the bigger portion of your less than side. So if already your answer is 0 0.999, if you multiply that by two, you will get more than one. So we, because we're talking about the not, the two sides, we need to be able to split the bigger portion into the smaller side, the smaller proportional sites. So we're going to take two times one minus the table value. So we need to get one minus the table value that will give you your p value. And remember the decision, okay, the rule. 
a decision. The decision rule state, if the P value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. That's how you will make use of the hypothesis testing. So these are the things that you always need to remember and put uh, bear in mind when you deal with hypothesis testing. Um, what else? Nothing else from this side. I'm not going to go into the activity and look at how, but always remember that every step of a hypothesis testing can be one of the options on your statement as well that you need to, to answer. Uh, so when you look at hypothesis questions, like um, actually this one they gave you, uh, the hypothesis testing in different so yeah is one example so you need to be able to know how to state your null hypothesis you need to be able to know how to find the critical value you need to be able to know how to calculate the test statistic you need to be able to know how to find the p-value and make decision and conclude which are all the steps that i just explained so you just need to be able to know all the steps but also the key things how do we do certain things? How do I determine what my null hypothesis and my alternative would be based on the information given? Can I put a greater than or equals to in the, in the alternative? No, you cannot because in your alternative hypothesis, there can never be an equal sign to it. How do you get the, uh, the, the region of rejection. Is it a one-tailed test or is it a two-tailed test? Do I need to say alpha divided by two? Those things are very, very important, especially when you do your critical value. You need to know and be able to look at that. So for Z, the critical value, when it's alpha divided by two, you already know all those things. It's 1.96, it's 1.645. But for Z alpha, it's totally different. So you need to be able to know how to find the critical value on the table. On the table. What we didn't touch now is that finding this critical value of Z alpha. Alpha is the probability within the table. If you go to your Z table, these are your alpha values in terms of the critical values. So if you need to find Z alpha of 0, 0.05, you just come inside the table and look for 0, 0,05 and you will find that. And because remember, this is one of those exceptions where we use the 1,645, 1,6,45. It applies to the same thing as what we just did there. Uh, if you want to find Z value of, it will still apply to the same. So it don't get caught up with how do I find uh, Z alpha divided by two? Is it different to Z alpha over two? The fact of the matter is the minute they put the Z alpha, the answer and you get it 0, 0,05, it will be the same as if you would have calculated Z alpha divided by two and you find your critical value by using the answer, which would have been 0, 0,05. It's the same thing, but you just need to make sure that you know that you're using your value of your alpha correctly, when to divide it by two and when not to divide it by two, because you can make a slightest mistake on that. You will use the wrong value. You will get to the wrong answer. So one slight mistake, it changes everything. So that is hypothesis testing. The last two things that we discussed that we know and learned about are those two important things that we did with the template. You just need to know your chi-squared and your regression. I'm not going to touch on both of them because it's something that we just did them two weeks ago. Um, one, we did the regression we did last week as well. 
So in terms of chi-squared, remember that if they give you a contingency table without the totals, calculate the totals. They are very important. Know that you need to calculate your expected value by using your row total times your column total divided by your grand total. And to calculate, uh, somebody said they, uh, they don't know how to calculate the expected value. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. But to calculate your chi-square test, we use the sum of your observed minus your expected by two squared divided by your expected. So if in your table that looks like this, the values in here are called observed. You use your expected to calculate your expected value, formula to calculate your expected value. You just substitute them. So let's assume that our observed values table was like A, B, and L and M was one and three and five and four. Your expected, you would have calculated it the same and found the expected, right? And you will have found A and B and L and M. I'm just making rough things here. Let's assume that the expected year was 1.1 and the expected year was 2 and the expected year was 6 and the expected year was 3, right? All what you do with this formula is just say your chi-squared is your observed is 1 minus your expected 1.1. You square the answer. You divide by 1.1. Plus, you go to the next, say, 3 minus 2 squared divided by 2. Plus, you go to the next, 5 minus 6 squared divided by 6. Plus, you go to the next one, 4 minus 3 squared divided by 3. You can do this manually by saying 1 minus 1.1 is 0 0.1 squared. That answer, which is 0 0.1 squared, divide by 1.1 and get the answer. Plus, you get the answer. Plus, you get the answer. And that will give you your, your test. But also remember, you need to also go find the critical value. So it means you go to the chi-squared test to find the critical value, which is also similar to how you find the critical values. 14, you will use the degrees of freedom and your upper tail area and not the cumulative to go find the critical value. And also, you can tell what type of a test it is. It is a left skew test. It's not a symmetrical test. The other thing that you need to always remember with chi-squared is to make a decision as well. With regression, we deal with two numerical values, the scatter plot tells you the relationship, you just need to know how to interpret the correlation of coefficients and how to calculate the coefficient of determination and interpret the coefficient of determination. Also, you need to know how to use your A is equal to AX plus O, B0 plus B1, B0 plus B1X, which is your regression line. How to estimate the value, how to calculate the slope, and interpret the slope, how to calculate the intercept and interpret the intercept. Those are the things that you need to learn and practice and know how to do them. And on that note, thank you for coming. Are there any questions before we leave today's session? Lizzie, just a question with regards to the class that you have tomorrow. Um, will we do revision in that class as well, or will we be no, uh, No, you see, you're asking me about our e-tutorial. With e-tutorial, we have our own plans, so you need to check the schedule, right? We are still, so this is different to, to that, how I handle the two. Okay. So with it, the class for tomorrow, we're dealing with assignments. What assignment are we in? Assignment uh -huh. five, right? We're mm. still 
we're still busy with assignment five. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I will see you tomorrow. Yep. Um, and then for this one, we are, today was our last session and uh, you will have to wait for the uh, correspondence from UNITA to see if we're going to set up additional sessions, um, especially the exam preparation sessions. Uh, I know that the timetable, provisional timetables might be out. Um, it might change or might not. If it's a final timetable, so everyone would have received one, you know when you're writing your exams, uh, when is your exams kick starting? Uh, you know that October it's mostly like exams and UNISA might not offer additional classes for that. But that does not stop me from supporting you. Like I said, those who have been attending tutorials or academic sessions, I might ask that they send you a link where you are able to book for one on one consultation with me. Um, I don't have a lot of days and a lot of times, but that hence I am only allocating to those who have been attending because then you have spent time and dedication for me to assist you. As th therefore, you will get priority in terms of the one on one consultation if I have to hold one. Other than that, we will have an exam preparation based on your modules separately. STA 1610 on a separate day, STA 1510 on a separate day, and STA 1501 on a separate day, where we only look at your question paper and answer questions and deal with your own module content. Thank you for coming. I will see you when I see you. I don't know when. Thank Happy you. learning. Enjoy your day. Bye. Enjoy your Thank day. you. Bye-bye. Enjoy your day as well. Bye, everybody. <laughs>